This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. I know we're all tired of hearing about coronavirus and would rather just put the last year behind us, but the recent pandemic has now morphed into something entirely different. In the last few months, the narrative around COVID-19 has shifted from how to stop it to where it came from. We're beginning to hear a lot of mainstream news figures, including many who ridiculed the previous administration, adopt very similar language as was used by Trump and his more rabid fans. In this episode, we're going to talk about the resurgence of the lab leak hypothesis, what it means, and discuss the state of biological warfare capabilities around the world. Fairly early in the pandemic, a popular talking point on the political right was that the coronavirus had originated in a Chinese laboratory. Trump presented this hypothesis in his typical crass, casually racist manner, and his fans ate it up. The corporate media and Democratic politicians widely criticized this idea as being unfounded and without evidence. And the prevailing narrative was that the virus originated from animal to human transmission, likely in a marketplace in Wuhan. Now, a year later, the Biden administration has officially launched an inquiry into the lab leak hypothesis. And what had long been dismissed as a QAnon conspiracy theory suddenly became a mainstream liberal talking point. News networks like CNN and MSNBC are conducting daily panel discussions on the history of Chinese secrecy and biological research. While it has been funny to watch conservatives denounce their once dearly held hypothesis because liberals have adopted it, the shift in political and media rhetoric should be telling. Let's start with a few facts. Coronavirus most likely originated in Wuhan, China. There is a biological laboratory in Wuhan, which is located very near the markets which were the supposed origin of the disease. From Wuhan, it spread all over the world, with individual nations handling the crisis in their own way, some much more effectively than others. China was not terribly prompt with announcing the spread of the infection, which was irresponsible, though understandable if they thought they could contain it. Over the past year, more than 3.7 million people have died from the virus, the US leading the way with 612,000 deaths, nearly twice the number of the second worst affected country, India. The US COVID response was arguably the worst in the world, especially given the vast resources at our disposal, and hundreds of thousands of deaths could have been prevented if our government had acted promptly and effectively to contain the spread of the virus. So, why have both conservatives and now liberals latched onto the lab leak hypothesis? It has very little to do with finding the truth. In fact, it has everything to do with obscuring it, managing it, and that should be obvious with how quickly those in power have shifted their narrative when it suddenly became convenient for them. Over the last 15 months, we've been fed bits of information only when it was beneficial to American leadership and commercial interests, and not a moment before. First, there was supposed consensus that the virus came from infected bats, that there was no chance it came from a lab, that the US had no advanced knowledge of what was coming. One president leaves, another takes power, and suddenly the narrative completely flips. Now there's a consensus that a lab leak is probable and that the Chinese tried to cover it up. Where's the truth? Why are elected officials and the corporate media so hell-bent on managing the flow of information to the American people? As usual, it has to do with power. The US is actively gearing up for war with China, and they need to manufacture our consent. This is so obvious that no one should be surprised when it becomes official. We're following the exact same playbook as in the lead up to the Iraq war. 24-7 media coverage, serious words from politicians about democracy and freedom, the whole nine yards. But what makes this instance different is that the US is implicated in the shady activity they're trying to pin on China. Now, before we go any further, we need to understand something called gain-of-function research. In biological laboratories, scientists sometimes engage in a particular area of research that involves altering an organism or disease in a way that changes its process of development, transmissibility, or types of carrier. Changes may be too soft a word, as gain-of-function research often aims to increase a pathogen's threat level. You may be thinking, okay, that's terrible. Why would anyone do that? But there is actually some value in this type of study. For example, if scientists managed to alter a pathogen in such a way that allowed it to infect an animal that previously couldn't transmit the disease, it could give them valuable insights into what specific parts of the pathogen cause it to accept certain hosts, which is an important step in developing antiviral medicines which block that function. Of course, this also comes with the risk of creating deadlier, mutant strains of disease that are harder to cure. Gain-of-function research is highly controversial, and with good reason. Theoretically, it could give us a head start on tackling future pandemics. 
But on the other hand, it could very easily lead to accidental infection and spread of mutant diseases. This, some independent researchers are beginning to suspect, is what happened with COVID-19. Scientists in biolabs around the world engage in this kind of research, and it's not uncommon for there to be accidents. For example, in the US, the frequency of lab incidents increased from 16 in 2004 to 269 in 2010. This, predictably, stems from a massive expansion in US biolabs both at home and stationed in other countries. The number of biolabs in the US alone increased from 400 in 2004 to 1500 in 2014. There have been suggestions that Chinese scientists were infected with coronavirus as early as late 2019, well before the pandemic became global news. These allegations have been denied. But what does this have to do with the US investigation? Well, according to some investigative journalists, China was cooperating with United States and World Health Organization officials on gain-of-function research related to the coronavirus. This was a fairly new development, as gain-of-function research had been paused during the Obama administration, but was later restarted under Trump. This is a big deal, not only because it lends credence to the lab leak theory, but because it implicates top World Health Organization scientists as well as high-profile American medical professionals like Dr. Anthony Fauci. If this is actually the case, if the US and China were working together on gain-of-function research on the coronavirus, if the US was funding it as the reporting claims, then it makes perfect sense that the corporate media and both administrations have worked so diligently to control the narrative. They need to keep up the pressure on China to manufacture consent for war, but they don't want the US to be implicated in the crisis. It's damage control. What's particularly suspicious is that the World Health Organization has appointed Peter Daszak, the president of the EcoHealth Alliance, as the primary investigator into the lab leak hypothesis. Why is this suspicious? Because EcoHealth was reportedly the source of the US funding for China's gain-of-function research. That's like having a police station investigate itself for police brutality. They're going to say it didn't happen. This is likely the US's way of preparing to denounce China for criminal negligence while distancing themselves from the blame. It's no wonder China isn't being cooperative with the US if the investigation really is a sham. To draw a fairly recent parallel, this saga is like the Mueller report all over again. Highly publicized, very dramatic, involving high-profile investigations, and will probably yield an inconclusive verdict in the hopes that the public will just kind of accept it and move on. As a side note, some of these details are also being loudly proclaimed by some of the most detestable right-wing figures in America. But they're doing it simply to own the libs. Any real evaluation of the situation must come with a material analysis of power and how it is wielded in the United States. As far as outcomes go, if I had to guess, my money would be on any eventual report being inconclusive, and the US continuing to ramp up its anti-China rhetoric as a prelude to war. I'm sure we'll find out soon enough. Now, while the COVID lab leak hypothesis is the most current example of at least the possibility of deadly viruses escaping containment, it's only symptomatic of a larger problem, and that's the proliferation of global biological weapons capabilities. As I mentioned earlier, since the turn of the century, the US has built hundreds of new biological laboratories, including more than 200 in 25 foreign countries, and that's just the ones we know about. Now, biological weapons are completely prohibited by a 1975 treaty called the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, or BTWC, to which 183 countries are party, including all the major world powers. As of May 2021, there are 10 nations who have neither signed nor acceded to the treaty. This short list includes America's favorite ally, Israel, which does not bode well for Palestinians. The BTWC is regarded as perhaps the most important arms treaty of the 21st century, but it has two serious problems. First, formal verification of compliance is not part of the treaty, meaning the whole thing is basically on the honor system. As long as a nation says they're not researching or producing biological weapons, they're good. Second, the treaty does not prohibit defensive biological research. That is, ways in which a nation can combat biological warfare. If there's one thing we know about the United States, it's that everything we do is classified as defense. All our invasions, coups, and wars are always cast as defensive, when they're clearly not. I suspect our defensive biological program is no different. These two failures of the treaty combine to make one very big problem. If nations are allowed to build and maintain hundreds of biological research facilities, and there's no one to confirm that they are indeed defensive, how do you think the deeply distrustful world leaders will see foreign labs? They'll see them as a threat. They'll assume their enemies are concocting deadly biological weapons, and they'll feel pressured to do the same. 
It's a similar problem to nuclear proliferation. If that country over there has nukes, I better have some too. Except it's worse because unarmed nukes can't silently infect people and escape the military base. Pathogens and diseases can. The history of biological weapons is secretive and terrifying. Back in the 60s, the world's major powers had reportedly developed enough bioweapons to kill every single person on Earth. Frankly, we got very lucky. One of the more well-known US biowarfare labs is the top secret Dugway Proving Ground. Established in 1942 to test biological and chemical weapons, and located on over 800,000 acres of Utah desert, roughly the size of Rhode Island, much of Dugway's history and activity remains a closely guarded secret. But there are some incidents that have become public knowledge. One mistake that made headlines involved a nerve agent known as VX and roughly 6,000 sheep. In March of 1968, a military plane blasted the nerve agent into the air during a test, and the wind carried it some 30 miles to nearby, and aptly named, Skull Valley. Shortly after, 6,249 sheep were found dead or dying. Though the army has never admitted fault, they compensated the rancher who owned the sheep, and an investigation confirmed that the animals had indeed been poisoned by VX. This wasn't the only mishap involving Dugway. In 2015, it came to light that Dugway officials had accidentally shipped live anthrax to states across the country. Shortly after, it became apparent that the problem was not new, and it sparked an investigation. Dugway's history is riddled with questionable projects, including testing bombs full of fleas, which they would presumably infect with diseases and drop on target populations, or mosquitoes infected with inert diseases, which they tested on human subjects and various biological and chemical weapons originally intended to be deployed during the Korean War. Of course, the US denies that these weapons were ever used in combat. If we know about the weaponized fleas and mosquitoes, I shudder to think of all the projects we don't know about, as Dugway is still a top secret facility, despite their recent PR attempts such as hosting a trail race on their testing grounds. I would definitely bring some bug spray to that race. Another such facility is Fort Detrick in Maryland. Located on a much more modest 1,200 acres of land, Fort Detrick is no less secretive and dangerous than Dugway. During World War II, personnel at the installation produced 5,000 anthrax bombs for the military, though they were supposedly never used. Between 1945 and 1955, as part of Operation Paperclip, US leadership secretly recruited Nazi scientists to work on US military programs, including chemical and biological warfare. Many ended up at Fort Detrick, including several who had actively participated in heinous medical experiments on concentration camp inmates. Like Dugway, the personnel at Fort Detrick also studied weaponized insects, including ticks, fleas, ants, lice, and especially mosquitoes, which they infected with yellow fever. One author and expert on the subject wrote in 2009 that it's highly likely that the US did employ infected insect weapons during the Korean War to spread disease, as in the fall of 1950, the US Joint Chiefs of Staff had approved their use, quote, at the earliest practicable time. During the 1950s, the installation conducted countless experiments involving biological agents on human subjects, who, according to the official record, were all volunteers. Today, like all the US's biolabs, Fort Detrick supposedly conducts only defensive programs, and has stopped production of any biological or chemical weapons. Hopefully that's actually the case, though I think it's wise to be skeptical. And even if the US and all the other nations party to the treaty have remained honest since the 1970s, the threat of accidental leaks and exposure remains. Case in point, activity at Fort Detrick was temporarily suspended in 2019 for numerous breaches in protocol and violations of federal procedure. In the CDC's report, which contains extensive redacted sections for supposed national security reasons, they cite six departures from the federal regulations for handling select agents and toxins, as well as failure to implement biosafety and containment procedures. Biolabs, especially those designated BSL-4, or Biosecurity Level 4, routinely house incredibly dangerous pathogens, including some that have no known cure and have the potential to be far deadlier than COVID. With so many facilities and so much secrecy, leaks are only becoming more likely, and an unwillingness of the involved nations to announce their mistakes will make for disastrous future pandemics. This governmental malpractice is something that everyone, regardless of political beliefs, should be against. Blindly following your preferred American political tribe is foolish, as we've seen clear evidence of Republican and Democratic talking points switching when it becomes convenient for those in power, and the corporate media dutifully promotes their propaganda. This topic is one of those things that sounds conspiratorial when you really get into it. 
But a little bit of historical reading will show you that reality is often far more bizarre than any conspiracy theory. The things that the world's governments get up to, and the propaganda campaigns they produce, are insidious, sophisticated, and constant. I know this may seem bleak, and I know some people think my videos are too depressing, but it's important to be aware of these things. It's not hopeless. There's always something normal people can do to affect positive change. But it has to start with concrete analysis. Who are the involved players? Who stands to benefit from a certain narrative? The most critical thing any of us can do is to determine the fundamental aspects of any given problem, to understand its inherent contradictions. Only then can we act in a way that is informed and that drives us towards positive change. If this most recent pandemic did originate in a biological laboratory, I feel very confident in saying it was not intentional. There's no need to stoke fears about outright biological warfare. Working with pathogens is very risky, and it might be worth having a serious international conversation about the benefits and the risks of such programs. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is made possible by my patrons on Patreon. This type of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing explicitly anti-capitalist content, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every episode at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.